Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, the new live event here on YouTube. Uh, today, I'm joined by Mr. David Amberlin, who is an author, a speaker, analyst, and uh, all around great guy who a lot of you already know. And for those of you who don't know, you have a chance to meet him today. He is the author of a best selling book called SEO Help, uh, which came out um, a few years ago. And uh, that book has 20 chapters, and we decided to do a video for each one of the chapters. And right now, today, we're going to be doing chapter number 10, or, or David calls them steps in the book, step number 10, which uh, is about website design uh, when it comes to SEO. So without further ado, hello, David. Welcome. <laughs> Oleg, hi, and it's great to see you again. It's way too long since the last one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, definitely, likewise on this end as well. Also, always awesome to see you. So we'll talk about the. Uh, we'll start with the uh, website design, and the basic premise is pretty simple. Most people understand it, uh, and I do apologize for my visual effects. I'm playing around with green screen, so I'm trying something new today. Um, but anyway, the the website design is something that. Um, certainly is important because if you think about SEO in general, what is it we're trying to do? We're trying to help people do optimization for search engines so they can find our content online. And our, our content online is websites. I mean, that's the easiest way to describe it because that's what it is. It's not cars, it's not chairs, it's not books, it's websites. And so that's why I think today is kind of an extra special uh, step. Um, to talk about website design because once we do this SEO and then once people actually are able to find us, the website is our face to the public at large, to basically the, the viewing audience that comes to look at, at uh, our content. And that's where it makes all the difference in the world in terms of their, I mean, SEO itself is certainly important to get them there. But in terms of website design, that becomes the next step because, you know, if, if you, get somebody to help you get a job and you don't know anything about the job, you might get the job, you know, if you talk well enough or whatever it might be, but you still won't be able to do the job. So this is where it becomes a situation where a lot of people get into SEO, 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 which is wonderful, but you got to remember that the whole purpose of SEO is to get people to come to your website and see your content. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So David, I'll let you continue from here. Okay. Okay. Uh First of all, that's a great analogy. So let's discuss that. And if we think that essentially we're trying to get a job, which means that we're trying to create a convert or create a conversion on the web in order to get some kind of um, outcome which we expect to get in terms of visitors. If we think of SEO as the resume which we send out, the website itself, once you see it, is the interview. And if the SEO, the resume, doesn't quite match up to the expectations that the visitor will have when they get to your website, the interview, you wouldn't get a job, right? And you wouldn't get any con any conversions in your website. Right. So I think the analogy you gave is really, really good because it helps to clarify the process. Now, traditionally, you're quite right. It used to be two separate things. You had a website, and the website used to have whatever the website designers you hired would put there. And then you would think, well, I need to get some SEO now so I can become visible in search. So you would go away and hire somebody else who would come over and, first of all, they would look at your website and go, and they would give you a long list of things to fix, um, which were technical usually. And then they would then um, go into a number of activities which would help your site rank in search. And the job would almost be complete in that aspect. And it is no longer like that. So that's why your analogy of the job um, interview of getting a job was so um, apt. So essentially, when a visitor gets to your website, now they have specific expectations. Those expectations cannot any longer be divorced from the intent of their query or the um, query level they've actually put in. By query level, I mean the kind of um, uh, sort of results that come up generally for those types of queries across the world. So if, for instance, let's say that a particular query generates a particular type of website as part of the answer in the US, 
a similar query in the UK, you would need to generate an equal quality of website in the UK in order to answer it. Unless, of course, a global kind of question, in which case a US website would satisfy it. So how has that affected things? How has it changed things? Well, here's what, what it actually has done. When it comes to addressing your website design, you now have a very complicated job, which has a very simple um, outcome. Let's look at the complications first. First of all, you need to make sure that everything which you put in your website in terms of design now has a very functional and um, very real, uh, in the fullest sense of the word, purpose. So anything which is there simply to impress, you know, the usual bells, bells and whistles that used to go with website design traditionally, where you had flash elements, or now you know, we no longer have flash, we'll have the HTML5 equivalent going across here or going across there, pop-ups, digital assistants coming in and asking you, hey, can I help you? And so annoying. Things playing the moment that you open up the website and so on. All these things, unless they have a very specific purpose, and that purpose has to be always, is it going to help the visitor? Then the answer to them should always be no. It should be no for a couple of reasons. First of all, because overloading your website um, suggests that you're trying to push your visitor to have an experience which you want them to have, as opposed to what they want to have. And secondly, it loads, it uh, unnecessarily um, changes or overloads the loading time of your website, which also annoys your website visitors. And certainly it annoys Google, and they tend to sort of frown upon websites that take too long to actually uh, load because of all the elements there. So when it comes to website design, keep it simple, keep it direct, keep it functional, make sure it actually meets the requirements of the person who comes to be there, make sure the user experience, which now is an overall uh, guiding element, is really, really strong. The second thing you need to look at, of course, I've already hinted at it, it is um, loading time. If you have a website which is heavy because of graphics or because of uh, all the little social media apps that you've put there, or perhaps a video or audio, or whatever, uh, then that needs to be looked at. And sometimes, you know, if something is of real use to your online visitors, um, it could be perhaps a kind of a comment thread or a comment app that you have integrated. Well, you know, there's a trade-off. You need to think, is it serving them better in terms of having that there and the extra loading time? Is it serving me better? So, you know, there's no easy and fast solutions to this. You need to make some hard calls. Excellent. Then, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. So these are all the technical things which you need to think about when it actually happens, you know, it, 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 when it actually it, your website is being set up. And it's no good um, sort of allowing developers to take the lead here. I mean, some of them are absolutely brilliant and they're, you know, uh, very alert in terms of SEO, but some really aren't. You know, they happen to be developers. We use the tools at our disposal and those tools can do very flashy things which don't always serve you well. So really, you need to start with some very clear um, idea of what you want to achieve in terms of your website design and help guide them in terms of what they actually implement. Okay, and then so there's the, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, let's, let's stop here because well, there's a lot of other elements to actually uh, come, to, come to in a minute. Right, so the, those were the 32 words that conclude our HOA today. Uh, somebody <laughs> made a post saying that, you know, the, the best Google Plus post would be uh, most optimized is to use a 160-character post with 40-character headline. So I figured 160 characters is about 32 words. So David is going to just say 32 words. We're done today. So that was, <laughs> yeah. that, that was very quick, short. <laughs> quick, quick HOA. Yeah. Um, hopefully, the people who put that post together are not going to be throwing stones at me for saying that. But it's a little silly. <laughs> I That's hope so. <laughs> they have 160-character uh, posts all the time. But seriously, though, let's let's dial it back a little bit because you know we have different people who look at this thing and they're like, whoa, you know, David kind of went through kind of a lot of this stuff very quickly. Let's let's you know kind of peel it back a little bit, as you, David likes to call it, you know, like an onion effect. We peel it back and we get you know layer by layer basically into it. So when it comes to doing web design, and I'm going to speak more from a um, IT standpoint, because that's my specialty. I do uh, information technology consulting and development. I also do development, David, so be careful what you say about developers. 
<laughs> yes, but, I'm but, always careful. <laughs> but what, what David said though is absolutely true. Is you have usually when it comes to web design, you have I would say probably three kinds of people, or three different categories of people. You have people in business who can do attitude. You know, I can do I do my books, I do my AP, I do my payroll. I can do a website, not a problem. It's not that difficult. HTML, how hard can it be? And HTML is not that hard, okay? Yes, anybody can, and I, I mean that sincerely, anybody can put together simple web pages, simple websites. It's not rocket science, especially if you do it through HTML, where you just put in a little bit of text, few images. Definitely, anybody can do it, okay? To do it well is a totally different thing than just saying, I can do it. And this is where you get into trouble. It's like anything else that you do, if you do not know well how to do something you're not going to do it well you may be able to do it but you're not going to do it well and the question becomes with the website being your face out there to both existing and prospective clients do you want to look good do you want to come out with a good first impression things like that which everybody usually is trying to strive for or do you want people to just kind of say man that doesn't look very nice and and you know, move on to your competition, which there's plenty, a plenty of competition. In the old days, when the web started, people were saying, you know, build it, they will come, and they did. That's been gone for years. You know, you can build a website, nobody will see this website, which is where SEO comes in. But before we get into SEO, let's just talk a little bit about the, the website from, like I said, from IT standpoint. So the basic thing I would say at first is that, again, going back to what David talked about in this book, and by the way, the book we're referring to is called SEO Help. Um, and you can buy it from davidamerlin.com. You can buy it from Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Any normal uh, or respected, I should say, uh, book reseller will have this book available. So you can easily get it. And in the book, there is you know, different steps or different chapters talk about different things like uh, identity, uh, ontology. So there's all kinds of different things that are being talked about. And so there's a lot of these things that make up what you're portraying on the website. So if you think about the website, you know, people tell you just be yourself. Be yourself and you know know your audience. And you know, and you listen to this, okay, that makes sense. Be yourself. I guess I can be myself, but you cannot be everything to everybody. So keep that in mind that when people say, well you should do this for these people, you should do that. You could do something, but you cannot please everybody. So never try to build something that will you know, quote unquote, please everybody, you'll never be able to make it. So that's one thing. Second thing was you're trying to come up with a website. Think of it from a standpoint, like David was saying, it needs to be something that's relatively simple. And the reason is because people do not like to spend a lot of time because they just don't have it to look through, you know, 50, 1500 pages that talk about essentially the same kind of thing. All I want to do is I want to fix my shoes or I want to buy a bicycle or I want to do something, whatever your business may be providing. I don't need to have a tremendous amount, you know, tomes of information dumped on me just to find out how to get to you, what kind of stuff you do, uh, potentially look and see, you know, what other people are saying about your stuff. I mean, I just want to get some basic info to see if I want to do business with you. So you have to look at it from that standpoint. So when you talk about, like I said, three categories of people, the way I look at it is you got people who can do it themselves, and sometimes they do a great job. But most of the time they don't because that's not their job. They're not web developers. They're not programmers. Uh, they're not web designers. What they are is they're business people who thinks they can do everything themselves because a they don't want to spend the money and b uh, they just have this belief that they can get it done. And so those are the reasons for driving them. Second category of people are people who are developers. Okay, people who write programs, and that's all they do. And the people who write programs typically are not great at creative stuff. In other words, they're not very good at designing graphics, at designing layouts, you know, in terms of how you would see, you know, you, you, can, you can look at a, a printed page that looks pretty lousy, and then you open up Vogue magazine or Wired magazine, and it's a totally different feeling about how well it's designed in terms of the colors, in terms of the fonts, the sizes of fonts, uh, you know, the, uh, Side paragraphs. I mean, all these different things make a huge difference in terms of how uh, the look is. And so that's another thing that's happening with programmers that most of them are just not that great at that. They're great at writing code, but they're not great at designing uh, the look. 
And so then you have the third category of people who are graphic artists and graphic designers, and they do immaculate job of designing, but they're most of the time they're horrid at programming. They, they most of them don't even do any programming. And so what happens is what you're getting is you're getting a very pretty looking thing, but when it comes to actual functionality of the site, it falls on its face in terms of how users interact with it. And so you wind up, you really need a kind of a synergy between all these different capabilities. Somebody who does graphics well, somebody who does programming well, so they can do the functional and, and actual programming part of it done. Because websites are not just about HTML. The modern websites are HTML is definitely one of the main components, but you also have languages like JavaScript, which makes a tremendous difference in terms of how the website looks and works. You have additional languages like PHP, for example, which actually are brains behind web applications. It's not just a brochure website. You actually have an application that does things. Like, for example, one of my websites allows people to order uh, food online. You know, there's a lot of logic involved. There's a lot of different things with credit cards being entered and being, you know, paid for and things like that, all happening in real time, done totally by computers. So you have to be able to get all these components in place, whatever your website is supposed to do. Uh, so you got to get these talents somehow. If you're one of these people, if you're being a business owner that can do some of these talents, that's awesome. But if you're not, definitely let people come in who can who know what they're doing. So that's the other aspect of it. In terms of, um, well, the other things I want to talk about is what David said about website optimization. Um, right now, Google just came out you know, a few months ago with this new um, um, Endeavor initiative, whatever they call it. It's called AMP Project, which stands for Accelerated Mobile Pages. And what it is is a way, because so many people now use mobile devices, which is another whole category we need to talk about, and we will here, is ability for people to quickly and easily load website on their phones on the, and on their tablets because they're you know smaller size and it's different than big display on the desktop and because so many people are and more so every day are using mobile devices google made a special effort with these amp pages so now you have this other category all of a sudden people are you know hearing about amp this and amp that many people don't know what it is many people don't know how to put it together and this is, again, where developers come in who do know how to put it together. And so you have to kind of try to get some of this information from somebody who knows what they're doing to explain to you exactly what you need to look at to get the web presence and online presence done well. OK, that's definitely very, very important. And then you actually sit down and you do the design part of the website where you're working on the, uh, the way it looks, the way it functions, what it does. And of course, it always has to be congruent with your personality or your business's needs or your business's what you're trying to convey to people and what you're trying to bring. It's not so much what your business needs. What you're trying to convey is what the audience that comes to your website, you're trying to address their needs because you're really building websites for them, not for yourself. So one of the things that also important to remember is if you are hiring people to come in and do this for you and you trust them and they do a good job, let them do it. Okay, do not micromanage it, do not start with concepts or statements like can you move this pixel, you know, uh, two rows up, or can you make this green a little bit greener? You know, do not do not stop the process and wind up spending more time and spending more money because of this kind of slowdown and everybody gets frustrated and people leave. It's just, I've done a lot of different things where these kind of events happen all the time. And the best thing to do is to obviously have the right attitude towards it, get the right talent, and just simply sit down and get it done. One other aspect that I wanted to mention before I turn it back to David again is that do not work trying to design a website and try to make it to be everything, like I said, to everybody but make it to be a perfect end result. If you're lo looking at print media, for example, when you're trying to come up with a nice looking page for a magazine, once that magazine is published, there's nothing anybody can do because paper is there, it's out, done. There's nothing you can do. If you screw up spelling or you screw up color or anything else, that's it. I mean, there's nothing you can do. Websites you can change. If you want, you can change them daily if you really wanted to do it. Nobody really does that, but I'm just saying, 
the physical capability is there. You're able to go and change the content, change the colors, change the layouts, change the number of pages. You know, all of this can be changed at any point in time. So the idea of coming up with a perfect site and then launching it is a faulty idea. What you want to do is you want to come up with a good site. Everybody's on the same page. For the current time period, this should do the trick, and you launch it. Okay, And then when you launch it, you see how well it's working, how many people are coming, what are they saying about the website, and then you can determine based on that if you need to make any adjustments, any changes, because like I said, you can easily make those changes. So with that, David, I'll let you continue, and then we'll get back. <laughs> OK, I think that's awesome. I think you covered some really important um, elements here. You mentioned AMP, which is the Accelerated Mobile Pages. We're going to get back to this in a minute, um, a little bit later on in the Hangout. It is hugely important. It addresses quite a lot of things, and it does change quite a lot of um, other things. But let's uh, talk about what you just said in terms of the design and how it should be done, um, the impact of the design on the visitor. Now, essentially, Google has a way of rating websites. Um, and we're talking about website design in SEO, which is a search engine optimization element of it, simply because now the website design itself has become one of the ranking factors in terms of how Google um, assesses a website and decides whether it should appear in search or not. Quite rightly, it used to be that you know a website would appear if it had um, the answers that Google was looking for in, in terms of a query, or if it was the only one in, in its category. And Google doesn't do that anymore. Uh, the end user experience it is, cr is critical in terms of how Google itself and its services are um, sort of impacted and um, assessed and accessed by the public. So essentially, everything that happens in terms of search has a brand impact for Google, which then affects their bottom line, which allows you to realize just how serious all this is. So essentially, Google is forced to algorithmically make um, uh, an educated assessment of the quality of a website. And in case you think this is subjective and very human, I can assure you it is not, because it is driven ultimately by the end user experience. If somebody landing on your website has a fantastic experience, they're really happy to go away thinking, OK, that was cool, became easy, and I did what I wanted to do, it's good for you, it's good for Google, it's good for the visitor, everybody wins. Now, in order to actually uh, begin to set a benchmark for that, Google has human raters. Uh, not too long ago, I think it was about a year and a half ago, uh, the guidelines were leaked on that. Um, and those human raters basically use a very basic principle, which is called EAT, E A T. And it's um, basically they assess a website in terms of expertise, authority, and trustworthiness. And they do that very quickly because that's how we actually also assess a website. So if your website design doesn't actually meet those expectations in terms of domain expertise, what is your subject matter? Can we see it very quickly? In terms of authority, does it look like an authoritative website or is it the kind of website that actually gives you a page of content sparsely um, um, sort of integrated with some kind of rich media and then surrounded by ads and pop-ups? And finally, trustworthiness. Is your website the kind of website that um, sort of projects that kind of trustworthiness that people are going to take seriously? If somebody is looking for information, for instance, and that information may be, let's say, health-related, they wouldn't want to get it from a website that serves, uh, I don't know, sort of all Hamburgers. kinds of ads. Yes. <laughs> yes. So you know, you need to have a sense that the website that you're actually getting information from um, is trustworthy in terms of the information it actually contains. And all these are considerations that you need to take into account, which suddenly means that you also need to start thinking about the type of visitor that you need to bring into your website and the person who's going to come there. And he, this is where all the magic actually happens. I mean, Oleg quite um, rightly said your website can be all things to all men. No, that would be impossible. The moment you try to do that, well, you know, you're just trying to get clicks to get ads, right? And that's ridiculous because, you know, we know that this in this model of business is already failing on the web because of the resistance that um, people have when it comes to websites. So essentially, in order for you to actually serve your customers best, what do you need to know? And this is where the simplicity comes in, right, in, in the complexity. You need to know exactly why you're in business. You need to know your identity. If you know your identity, then you have a very clear idea who would actually 
would be your ideal customer? Who is looking for the kind of thing you're doing? And if you have that clear idea in your head, then you begin to bring everything together so that your website itself, in terms of design, layout, content, delivery, speed, the works, actually meets the demands or the needs of that person you're trying to actually click with. And if you've done your job right, then they have a great experience. You have a great experience in terms of your digital business. And all we've done so far, we haven't even touched on the more sort of um, rarefied elements of SEO. We've just talked about basic common business sense in terms of setting up something that will meet a business need. And if you've done that job right, then it becomes very easy. Um, I think Oleg quite rightly also addressed the fact that it's very easy to fall into the trap where you know, you're using tools or you're allowing developers to use the tools simply because they're there. And I will also add one more element to this, which I've seen in the past, where somebody hires a developer and they think, well, the person doing the hiring has a vision in their head and they're going now to use a developer as a tool to realize that vision. And the developer user says, oh, no, we can't do that or we shouldn't do that because, and think, no, no, this is what I want and can you move this pixel from there to here kind of thing. Okay, both of these things are hopefully firmly in the past. If you're a serious business person today, going onto the, onto the web, you start thinking very carefully what you want to do with your website. So when you go to the developer, you are leveraging their expertise. You're leveraging their skill to bring that very real business vision you have to life. And then yeah, everything else to do. It's important, sorry that it's interrupted, but I think it's important to note here that, again, it's your business vision. It's not anybody else's. Yes. And so on one hand, I said, don't micromanage it, and I didn't mean it, and then it just reiterated that that's, you shouldn't be doing that. But at the same time, the what you're bringing us, the experience to the public out there, it's for your business. Nobody knows this business better than you. Yes. You can go hire a thousand developers. None of them know the business that you do. That's why it needs to be a, a synergy between the developers bringing their knowledge to the table and you being able to use that to bring your vision to the to the forefront. Exactly, and I think that's absolutely right. And and that should be your contribution to the project. It should be that business drive, business clarity, which then helps the developer help you as much as possible. Now, if that works the way you should, half the SEO, SEO job is already done because we should have a quality website, which is in place. We should have a fast loading website, which is in place. And we should also have real reason for every element that is there, which is there to help those people who actually come to the website in the first instance. And obviously, you know, we, we tend to sort of, if that happens, then the websites tend to be fairly flat in their design. And if they're fairly flat, they are also uh, a little bit faster in the load time. And certainly your developers will also help you to understand that, you know, if you put graphic elements there or pictures, they shouldn't be like five megabytes each. Right. And, you know, a lot of times people ask me, okay, so what should we put on the website? I mean, what? I, I don't know what to put on the website. I understand what you guys are talking about, you know, get some people involved, my business vision. Okay, I understand all that. I'm still totally at a loss. What exactly am I supposed to put on the website? And I think one of the, at least my personal opinion, how, the easiest way to think about this is think about a situation where people walk into your business. Okay, and of course, business could be different, but people walk into your business. There is a certain look and feel to your place of operation. Some businesses are run from their homes, I understand that. But for the brick and mortar places, for most other, you know, majority of the businesses out there, there is certain, they have a certain brand in place, you know, they have a logo and they have a certain look to, you know, the color of their walls, things like that. There is a certain look and feel when people walk into your office or into your business. Then they ask you, could you please tell, or let, you know, another example, let's go, you go to a party and somebody says, hi, hi, you know, what do you do? And so you're trying to explain in a very short amount of time what it is exactly that you do. And that's usually you have a small amount of time and you have certain only certain uh, information you can pass along. So you're trying to compress the information as much as you can. You know, try to stick to more than 32 words, though. Uh, as much information as you can, you're compressing it down to come up with something that would be very understandable by the person listening within, let's say, a minute of time. 
you know, like elevator pitch, they call it, or whatever you want to call it. The bottom line is what you're trying to do is when people come to your website who don't know you, if people know you, it's really simple. All you want to do is you want to give them basics that they need to know. How do I get a hold of you? Phone number, you know, map, directions, how to get there, all of that. And then potentially, you know, your business name, your logo. That's basically it, basic branding thing. So people who know you, they know you. There's nothing you're not trying to prove anything to anybody. They already know you. They just need to be able to consume or get to you, and that's it. Okay? The people who don't know you, which is the second huge category, those are the people you're trying to obviously get to your site so they will know you. And that's where it becomes more challenging, and that's why you should be using that kind of approach. At least that would be my recommendation, is to try to do a similar thing that what you would do in real life. And whatever you're showing them, whatever you're telling them, try to make that experience be, bring that to be online. I think that's the easiest way I can describe how, because, you know, people read a lot of stuff and there's magazines and books, you know, web this, SEO that, all of that. And then they come up with their heads and my head is about to explode. And I still don't know how to do the site. So to me, I think that I would recommend using this kind of approach because it's very lifelike and, you know, this is what you do normally. So that's what you would do on the website. That way also you're being very congruent between what you're doing you know, on the web and what you're doing in real life, which also is a good thing for branding and things like that. What do you think, David? Yeah. I think that's totally right. And I think, again, your analogy of a shop is absolutely correct. We are now at a stage where the digital tools at our disposal are so uh, detailed in their impact, and they're so minute in terms of how they basically um, affect those who see um, a digital presence that they act very much like a real life shop. So if you have a set up a shop, think about it, how would you go in doing so? It would very much depend upon the type of business you have, the level that at which that business operates. Is it like a bottom line, is it middle of, middle of the market, or are you a top end kind of a supplier of a product or a service? And finally, at the kind of clientele that you're hoping to attract. And this kind of seg segmentation, which is not really, um, really new in terms of business, it's always going on, now has to take place at every level when you actually set up um, a digital presence. And you need to think very actively about it. And I think, again, you know, you mentioned branding. It's invaluable because branding has to run throughout everything you do. It has to be offline. It has to be online. It has to be in those gray areas in between where the online connects to the offline. It has to do all those things. And we tend to think of branding as something separate and it isn't any longer. We tend to think that it's a soft skill as opposed to a hard skill. But essentially, it is that kind of soft skill which encompasses qualities and values and perceptions of trustworthiness that actually impacts the most when it comes to visitors on your website. This is why, for instance, and we mentioned this time and again in this Hangouts on Air, we so much trust Amazon as opposed to you know, Joe Blog, who sells exactly the same thing on his website for 10 bucks less. And you think, well, you know, are you are you being stupid? Why do you pay 10 bucks more on Amazon? Well, because Amazon makes the whole thing easy by removing all the perceptual barriers associated with trust, ease of transaction, and trustworthiness if things go wrong. And Joe Bloggs probably hasn't done any of that work. He's a totally unknown to us. And unless we have a real reason to go into an, an entirely new sort of set of um, transactions to find out who he is, then we wouldn't really be inclined to give him any business. And I also wanted to point out that if you look at it from a standpoint of, let's say, selling, like using David's example with Amazon, Amazon does absolute lion's share of business out there. But that does not for a second mean that nobody else is selling anything. There's plenty of websites that sell plenty of products, plenty of services, and they're doing really, really well. Because it might be because they're local, you know, that they happen to be in the area where, uh, People live in that area, so they buy from them. I mean, if you look at, the, you know, since one of the things they do is restaurant ordering, like I told you, perfect example. I have a local restaurant here. Would they want to deal with me providing the service for them using my website, which is, you know, I can services, I can help them do whatever needs to be done, or do they want to order and deal with some outfit somewhere in New York where they have to, you know, send an email and wait for three days for somebody to get back to them? I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer in terms of, overall experience that you get and so 
you know, don't if you're if you're in business to try to sell something, don't be intimidated by Amazon. You can certainly learn from them and utilize their tactics for customer service, which is stellar. I mean, I love Amazon not only because they live in the same city where they are, but just because they're such an incredible, incredible company. But the reason there is such an incredible company is because they provide the superior experience and customer service. It's not anything mind-blowing in terms of their showing circles as squares or anything. No, it's just there is the product, so you can do a search. There's a bunch of different people selling the same stuff, so you can get different pricing. And you can get better pricing, you know, things like that. People who, people, they show me people who bought a similar product or similar products, which is extremely helpful. They show me reviews of what people think of this. People can even ask questions of people who bought things. I get asked questions all the time about things that I buy on Amazon, and, you know, you can respond. It, it's absolutely beautiful how simple and how effective it is for the purposes of buying uh, a particular product or something. So where it used to be where you kind of cringe if somebody gives you a gift card from a store because you don't know if you're going to buy it there. Now if anybody gives you a gift card from Amazon, it's like, it's awesome because, you know, I can get whatever I want anyway because Amazon sells everything. And so it's great. So I think the important thing is not to get intimidated by them as a business person who is trying to sell something, but actually use them as an example and then build your site. Obviously, you don't have thousands of programmers like they have or the resources they have. But you got to remember, when they started, they didn't have anything either. They built this to be where they are. And so it's the same thing with whatever your business is, whatever you're selling. You can start small. There's so many tools out there, so many developers out there that can do a really, really good job for you that it's all doable. You know, it's not, it's not really that expensive. And so if you apply all this stuff, I think you can definitely put some together. So going back to the next thing I was going to talk about, so you figured out what you're basically going to do. Now the implementation phase or actually building a website, let's talk about that for a little bit. So you hire somebody, they come in, they're coders, they want to use this particular, you know, of course they want you to do WordPress, and, you know, they're going to use this particular template. As an IT guy, I'm telling you right now, do not automatically jump into the WordPress pool. Okay, it's definitely, you know, a lot of people will be telling you WordPress is it. It's not. It's not anywhere near as simple as many people imply, number one. And number two, if you start having problems with WordPress, it's a nightmare to deal with it. It is, okay? So there's certainly some people that know WordPress pretty well, but at the same time, from in terms of daily use and things like that, I've ran into more problems with WordPress than just about anything else, which is why I actually went back and developed websites for people now using regular HTML templates. I just, you know, there's just too many problems and it's not anywhere near like it's being sold. So you have to look carefully what people are telling you that they're going to develop in to make sure it's easy for you to maintain or they can maintain it for you and to make sure they're using some kind of tool that will be there or at least as you know nobody can guarantee anything but the idea being that you need to be able to have a peace of mind that you know you can a get somebody to work on your website if the people you're working with are no longer there and b it's being it's using the kind of tool that actually makes sense whenever you have developers coming to you and they're saying we're going to do it this way okay yes you don't know this web stuff and you don't know how to program you don't know any of this have them explain to you so you can understand why they're recommending a particular solution. So if a guy comes in and says, we're going to be using Joomla, and your you know, response to that is, I don't even know how to spell Joomla, you know, have them explain to you exactly why it is that they recommend using Joomla or they recommend using uh, you know, WordPress or whatever they're recommending putting it together. Because a lot of times, you know, obviously, just like anything else, there's good writers and bad writers. You know, you have people who do a lousy job trying to sell books, and you have people like David Emerlin who do a phenomenal job. So, you know, it's different. It's the same thing with programmers and developers. You get good ones and bad ones. So a lot of people try to minimize the amount of work they do by taking something they've already done for somebody else, and they simply want to replace your logo with their logo and replace some text, and they're done. So they have to do as little work as possible, still charging you normal price. So, of course, you wouldn't know that necessarily, but that's where it comes in with asking questions, okay? Don't ask him to explain to you what the, uh, you know, JavaScript uh, particular word represents or how to do PHP, nothing like that. Simply have them explain to you if they want to use a specific tool, 
why it is that they recommend that tool. If they want to use a specific template, why it is that they want to use that particular template. If they ex and explain it to you in English, not in PHP and JavaScript, explain it to you in English so you can understand. If they do a good job explaining it to you and it makes sense to you, by all means. But if it doesn't make sense to you, then either you're dealing with the wrong people or you're getting the wrong tool for the wrong reasons. And so that's that would be a few you know word suggestions I would say about that. And I'll let David continue with that. <laughs> I thought that was a really good rant. I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> okay. I mean, what Oleg is saying is, is gold in many ways. Essentially, whatever decision you make, make sure you can live with that. That's all it is. Um, as consulting with large corporations, I have seen way too many times a decision that was made based on a very narrow recommendation. And a company is saddled with a website that has been built by an agency that is using a proprietary code. And essentially, that has created so many different issues in terms of security, in terms of ownership, in terms of leaving the agency and going somewhere else. So, And then these are large companies. So mistakes like that are easy to make. They're even easier to make as an individual when you don't have the luxury of perhaps more teams or more knowledgeable, pe knowledgeable people advising you. So it is always good to do your due diligence, find some people you can trust and get their opinion, ask around. And certainly within Google+, Plus, I think, you can basically put something out in the open and somebody will help you in terms of, um, of, of replying. And there are also a lot of active communities in that regard. And finding a community and asking the people within it um, will also give you very targeted, very knowledgeable advice. Right, and this, that takes us back to another book by David Amberlin called uh, a Book About Trust. And uh, you can pick that up at davidamberlin.com. I should be doing your marketing there. Um, yeah, absolutely. I was thinking just that just now. <laughs> no, seriously, seriously, though, you know, it's, it's a great book. It talks about a very important aspect of just about anything we do in life in dealing with other people. And the bottom line is that we do not buy anything from anybody until we trust them. I mean, that's the main point David makes in his book and in many, many posts that he uh, created on the subject, is you do not deal with anyone unless you can trust them. And so that's what I would say about you dealing with developers and dealing with people who are going to help you put the website together, is make sure you trust these people. And if you trust them, then they should be able to do a good job. If you don't trust them for any reason, then you need to kind of back up a little bit and determine what to do. A lot of times, unfortunately, what happens is I mean, there's many different scenarios that happen, but a lot of times what happens, you deal with somebody and, you know, they sell you a bill of goods and then partway into the project, you know, two months into it, uh, you find out that all of a sudden it's not exactly coming out the way it was supposed to come out. So there's now saying there's going to be more money and now they're saying they need to make some changes and you're like, oh my God, you know, we talked about getting it done in a month, it's been two, now you're telling me it's going to be changes and more money. And so you need to make a call, which a lot of times the best thing to do is just to cut the cord. Because if you keep constantly bleeding and bleeding and bleeding, some people are like that. I had one client, um, which came to me unfortunately too late, but still, he said he was, the, the previous person he was dealing with uh, was accumulating all this information for him about different uh, print materials that to get designed on the computer and things like that. And they put all this stuff, uh, uh, you know, it was on the developer's hard drive. So when they decided to part company, or at least the owner of business decided to part company, the guy turned around and told him he'll give him the data for $2,000. And he, then the, the business owner says, this is my data. I mean, everything you've done, you got paid for, for work. It's my data. He says, yeah, I understand that. But if you want to get the data, I'll give you a hard drive with the data for $2,000. And the guy refused to even talk about anything else. And this business guy was in a position where he didn't have any choice. He wound up writing out this check, and that's it. So that's what I mean about trusting and, and having real good sense, at least, of trust in whoever you're dealing with because it makes a huge difference in both the development cycle itself, the quality of work being produced, and everything else. But that's true of anything you do with anybody. It's just important to bring it up when you do websites. I think it's important to, to keep that in mind, too. You need to trust people you deal with even more so than in some other cases, potentially, because for a lot of business owners, they don't know any of this stuff. 
They don't know technology in terms of details of it. They don't know HTML. They don't know JavaScript. They don't know MySQL. They don't know anything like that. But at the same time, they need to be involved and get things done. So that's where trust comes in, where you can have the synergy going in the, in the, in the kind of right flow. One other thing, you know, moving on from this point to the next point, I wanted to bring up uh, basic idea of how you would think about designing websites. You get the right people involved. You start working on it. In terms of SEO, let's get back to SEO again. One of the things that people don't talk about much, and they should, is you don't only optimize pages. We talked about AMP a little bit, and I think David is going to talk some more about that. But in addition to that, you also have a situation with things like, um, um, obviously, I think David will cover the, the point about specifically keywords, phrases, all of that. But I want to talk about more from a development standpoint is imagery. Because most of the time, people don't even think or talk about images. You know, without getting, again, into all the details about all the different formats and everything else, there's only a few formats of graphics you can create for the web that the web browser will understand. And one of these is called the uh, SVG. Basically, they're, they're vector graphics. And this SVG is kind of a new kid on the block. And it, you could potentially save. I've seen examples where you can save anywhere from 25 to 65 to 75% of, of space how much this exact same looking image will take uh, in terms of uh, storage on the disk. And the reason this is important is because we have more and more of our websites we always try to, you know, everybody tells us that, you know, pictures are worth a thousand words. And so, obviously, you know, you always do imagery. Nobody really creates posts almost at all on, on social media without putting some kind of image to go with it. And because it makes such a huge difference in terms of how people interact with it and how people like it and things like that. And so, yeah, we definitely put imagery on our websites. We want to have pictures of people. You know, we want to have pictures of products. I mean, all kinds of different pictures. So pictures make a huge difference in terms of the loading time that David mentioned before. And we talked, again, about the AMP thing as part of it, is that the more images you have, the longer it's going to take to load the, the page or the website. And the longer it takes to load, Google not only said that they like the concept of fast loading, because that's what people prefer, Google said, we're going to punish you if, you do, if your sites load too long. So they specifically will push you down when it comes to a search engine. Uh, placement in terms of where you are in the search engine results because your website takes too long to load. So one of the biggest, you cannot cut your text beyond the minimum that you're trying to convey. I mean, you can certainly take 10 paragraphs and try to compress them into five, but if everything you need to say and everything people need to get from you is 10 paragraphs, it's going to have to be 10 paragraphs. You can't really cut it. But the images is a totally different ballgame. And the smaller each image is, the less time it's going to take to load the website. And the more images you have, the more of an impact you're creating. So one of the things that you should definitely uh, keep in mind, and potentially tell your developers, because a lot of people, uh, especially developers who do things like graphic artists, uh, you know, they usually work with you know, tens of megabytes, um, sometimes hundreds of megabytes, actually, I should say. Uh, of imagery, image sizes. So if they work in a print medium, if you take a, P, a Photoshop file, for example, that would be, you know, for a 300 DPI in terms of printing quality, those things are multi hundred megabytes long. I mean, they're huge in terms of how much space they eat up. But people are used to working with that, so to them it's no big deal, and they don't realize that putting things on the web makes a huge difference how how much you can compress. So they just drop images there. You know, there is the image. And that's what it is. But you can make a huge difference. Number one, you can compress images that are, for example, JPEGs, which are the most common ones. But the JPEG is what they call a lossy format, meaning you lose the quality. The more you compress it, the, the less quality you're going to have on the graphics. So you need to be careful about how much you compress. Um, and so there's a number of different, uh, I mean, if anybody is really interested in discussing this more, feel free to grab me and ask questions, and I'll be happy to discuss the details of imagery. But the point I'm trying to make here is that it's important to understand that images make a huge become, it's a huge part of any website, and you can make a tremendous difference in loading time by optimizing these images by using either SVG format, which is what definitely I would recommend, or carefully compressing the JPEGs 
to make sure, or setting up GIF files, for example, if you don't have too many colors, because that would also look better, and they can be potentially a lot smaller. So just keep that in mind, that SEO, part of SEO involves loading times, as David pointed out. And so to be able to have smaller loading times, one of the simple things you can do without making any other changes is make sure your imagery is optimized. Another thing you can do when it comes to images is you know, Google is using web crawler to be able to find, uh, I mean, they, they use these web crawler, these uh, robots, basically, if you will, that run around and try to index your content. And then they have 200 plus different criteria applications to that content to determine where to put you on the list. And of course, SEO comes in to try to get you higher. That's the whole concept. So when Google is looking for these different things, they're looking for all your, they're going through your website. You know, they call them web crawlers because they're crawling your website. And so they're looking at tags. They're looking at images. They can't really tell much from images, but the size of them obviously it makes a difference. But another thing that Google can tell, and from what I read, they actually do look at it not as the main thing, but certainly part of the criteria, is the file names themselves. Because you can have a graphic that looks like David's face, for example, on your website. And David always looks great on websites. The only problem is that they call the actual image x.jpg. Well, Google doesn't know it's David. If it actually says David Amerland.jpg, now they have some reference that they can actually see that this is something to do with David Amerland, potentially. Or at least they can cross-check to see what is this entity called David Amerland, right? But if you have it called x.jpg, which it'll show up just, you know, David is going to look just as good on the screen. Google can't index that. So it becomes you're basically creating a detriment for yourself. Another thing you can do is there is a way to create sitemap, uh, sitemaps using XML language, which is kind of derivative. It's actually a super language from HTML. HTML is a subset of XML. But in XML, you can create these sitemaps, and the sitemap for imagery is something that Google also looks at, if you set it up correctly, to help it get this indexing done correctly. So those are some of the things you can definitely do. It takes a little bit of time. It doesn't take that much time. It takes a little bit of time. If you look into it or you ask your developers to pay attention to that, get this done, because the sitemap itself is not visible on the web. It's just something that this web crawler will be able to look at and be able to, uh, it'll help it get things indexed the way you, you want to index it. And that's all becomes part of SEO. David? OK, some really important points there. Um, I think, and now I think it's time to also start talking about accelerated mobile pages. Um, speed is really important. I think there's also a transition in how we use the web. Most of us these days use a tablet or a phone most of the time. And then we graduate to a desktop. We link all these things up. Google knows from data that we use them differently, that we start our search somewhere else and we complete our purchases somewhere else. And let's not forget also that in this day and age, mobile devices, for some people, are the primary means of accessing the web. So unless you really have a business reason, you wouldn't or you wouldn't need or you shouldn't need a laptop. You know, laptops have bigger screens, but so do tablets. And, you know, you get a 10-inch or 11-inch tablet, and that's great. You don't need anything like a laptop. It's fast, it's portable, it's way cheaper, and it doesn't break as easily, and you can do most things with it. Because of that, a lot of people are actually using mobile devices to access the web. Uh, that means that a lot of websites really need to work really well in terms of how they appear on, on a smaller screen. And this is a huge consideration in terms of the design elements that we actually implement there. But the most critical factor here is how quickly they actually appear on the screen the moment you try to access them. And this is where the, um, the uh, AMP, which is the um, Accelerated Mobile Pages project, which is an open project that Google um, has is part of, and so is um, Amazon and Apple, I think, and Facebook are part of that, uh, have actually joined in. No, I think Facebook has their own. Uh, Facebook has its own, own. You're right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, it does. It actually has its own uh, version of that. But mm -hmm. essentially, what is it? It is um, a very stripped down code in terms of how HTML works on the web um, with a very minimalistic approach in terms of all the supporting elements, which pulls things to get technical from a JavaScript library and allows things to appear very, very quickly. Now, what does it mean? It means that essentially a website that is cached by Google 
uh, or sometimes by its owner, uh, will appear on a device ultra fast without loading the device or the more critical thing, testing the device owner's patience in terms of what they want to do. That usually generates a good user experience and here's, here we come back to that again. So essentially a good user experience uh, creates that sense of um, relationship building and trust building with a website in terms of what the person that is visiting, visiting it wants to achieve and that usually then has a, a, a sort of a better transactional outcome than any other kind of experience. And, and that's the whole point in terms of all the things that Oleg said, all the thinking that needs to go into the website design. We're basically thinking um, how to make the website appear faster, easier, so the person that accesses it has a great experience when visiting it. There's nothing more frustrating than waiting for a page to load on your phone forever. And you know, you start looking at your apps and thinking maybe I should close all the apps I've got here, maybe I should upgrade my phone, maybe I don't know banging against the wall in order to make it work faster. It is really, really frustrating. Google has data on this. For every half second of delay time, you lose 10% of visitors. So if you think an extra two seconds of load time, that is actually um, usually about 20% of visitors which are going to disappear, which is quite a sizable uh, chunk. Yeah, so from, from the standpoint of um, KMP, just a few words I wanted to add to what David said. Um, is from the technical standpoint, uh, AMP HTML is slightly different than regular HTML. So you know, if you're going to do this, then that's you know, the, the, it's it's slightly different. It's similar but slightly different. One thing. Second thing, it doesn't support everything HTML does right now. So one of the big glaring things they don't have right now, for example, is forms. And there's a way to use a there's a hacking approach to you know. I'm not going to get technical again because I don't know how much everybody who's watching this knows about this. Bottom line is there is a way to mimic or kind of do a hack job so the forms would kind of work. But because Google changes things and because it's not a standard, I wouldn't recommend doing it for right now. Just go with the concept that forms do not work on AMP. And so the, the way to look, because of some of these limitations and because of things working slightly different, what Google did was they put together a couple of really nice online validators. And I'll put in the Google space, I'll put in links to some of these validators that allow you to drop your AMP code directly into it, and it'll tell you if, if Google uh, validates it as a valid AMP page. And if it is, you're good. I think they just, uh, just to add to this, um, Oleg, I think they actually released a tool just uh, yesterday, which apart from validating actually highlights. The, the, the other one did too. No, both of them do yeah. that. It's just a little bit nicer. Yeah, the new one they released okay. a little bit nicer. But basically, okay. yes, you will get exact indication of what it is that they don't like, and then you can go fix it, and then you know you get a, a free pass if you do. Uh, and so definitely, you know, validate all your pages to make sure that you know they're AMP uh, validated according to Google. But one of the things that what I wanted to say here is that what I did with um, a couple of my clients, because right now, if you look at some Google News things like that, they're switching as much as they can. They even are doing some of the uh, search engine result pages or SERPs, they're doing those using AMP as well. I mean, they're trying to go with AMP as much as they can because of this multinational movement of people switching to use phones for more and more stuff. And so people are using phones, so they want them to have as good experience as possible. And AMP is what delivers this good experience with the speed changes. But you just need to be cognizant a little bit of some of the subtleties. You cannot just take a website and drop it directly and become AMP. It doesn't work like that. Okay, you can build one and make it so it's AMP capable, but that. So my, my personal approach was with a couple of clients. What I did was I created a subset sites for them, almost like little brochure sites, because like I said, I can't do forms, I can't do you know online shopping on there, I can't do any of that stuff. Easy a link from AMP to non-AMP, but then it becomes non-AMP. So what I was thinking and what I implemented, and I think Google uh, is still going to show me Google Log for this from a SEO standpoint, is think of these things as gateways to your main websites. So you build this mini site that's pretty much a brochure site in AMP with having all kinds of SEO goodness in there so Google will grab it, Google will see that it's true AMP and definitely will position you better. And then from there you can have links to go to your other site if people need to go, just keep that 
whatever other site you link to, keep it to be um, responsive, meaning the site has code in there that adjusts automatically depending what device is being looked at. So if, if you're looking at a website on a desktop, it'll look nice. If you're going to a tablet, it'll look nice. If you go to a phone, it'll still look nice. In other words, that's what they call responsive websites. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you know, your AMP website links to a responsive website, and then you're fine. But this AMP goodness that Google is looking for, that speed, that initial experience, is enough to grab people. And so you can, I mean, nobody's saying that. It's just my own approach, basically. But I recommend think of it as a gateway to your main content. And so if you build an AMP site, Google will give you that much more SEO love. And that's what the name of the game is here. Um, just a small addition to this. If you actually want to see what an AMP page looks like, if you go to the newspaper, The Guardian, theguardian.com website, if you click on any story there, and at the end of the URL, you then type slash AMP, you will see the stripped down version, how different it looks and how much faster it appears. So it, it's a very easy example of looking at a web page as opposed to an AMP page and it does load extremely fast, and it's a very stripped down version. Right, or you can go, you know, this is for our friends in, in Britain, uh, and for those of us who live uh, on the other continent uh, and don't read Guardian, uh, no, I'm just <laughs> But uh, you should. <laughs> no, 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 what I was going to say was, uh, uh, if you look, you know, one of the easiest examples, I don't have my phone on me, but uh, if you go to Google News, if you simply pull up Google News, uh, News and Weather app, you will see they actually show the words AMP, and there's AMP actually has a little symbol on it, which looks like a little lightning. And, yep. and that's how you can easily tell. Uh, you know, it shows right there. You can see these these are the AMP pages, and you can see just how quickly they load, and, and you can have a little sliders. It's not, by the way, don't uh, think that what I said about AMP being limited, that it's useless. I mean, it's, it's extremely useful. You can have sliders. You can have accordions. You can have, uh, I mean, obviously, regular text. You can have images. You can have embedded videos. All of this can be done in AMP, and it's you know different, a little bit different than a, than regular HTML, but not not tremendously. So it, it's pretty easy for any developer to learn. And uh, you know, I just started with AMP, and I already built a couple of websites, and it's 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 great. It works really nice. Hmm. That's that's yep. really cool. <clears throat> so essentially, just wrapping up now a little bit on when it comes to website design and SEO. We've got to the stage where search engine optimization needs to be baked into the heart of your business and the core of your website. And it starts with just about everything. It has to work. Now it encompasses, you know, something which used to be very technical in the past and very segmented now has very widespread impact. It, in, it includes branding, it includes marketing, it includes content. It includes technical SEO, which is still extremely um, complex at times. It includes um, social media, and it definitely includes your website as one of its pillars, one of its foundations. Um, so the design needs to be taken into account. Design considerations have to be very business-like now, as opposed to artistic. Not, not the impact is not important, but everything has to have a real reason as Oleg um, stressed a few times already, in terms of why it is actually being implemented. And if there, is, if there is no real reason there beyond making it look pretty, for instance, then it shouldn't be there. Right. And, and, and you know, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about, uh, talking about uh, templates. Because one of the things mm -hmm. that you, you know, people do is they go and they can get, it used to be expensive, now it's very cheap. If you go to a website like, uh, um, themeforest.net is you know the one I, I like a lot. You know you can buy a template. You know if you if you have to use WordPress, you can buy WordPress templates for as little as forty fifty dollars, and you can buy HTML templates for as little as you know ten fifteen twenty dollars. So they're very very inexpensive, and you get them and you just need to know what you're doing, but you can modify them and they look pretty everything else. But some of these templates they have they have this you know what they call parallax effect that a lot of people wanted to do for a while. Where you know, things start scrolling and this and that, and um, kind of rolling basically out. And they had, uh, there's a number of different things, but a lot of th some of these things are loaded with all kinds of JavaScript-related 
uh, and you know jQuery related, and and some of them are even mostly they don't use uh, Flash anymore because it's dying and dying and dying. And if ever anybody recommends you to use Flash, definitely get a different developer because nobody should be developing <laughs> Flash now. I mean, it's got many, many many different problems with Flash, and uh, <clears throat> as much as I was not a huge fan of Steve Jobs, at the same time the man was right on when he said that the Flash is definitely something that should be. Uh, decapitated, and that's exactly what's going on with Flash. So do not use Flash. But people use other things that make visuals be very, very kind of in your face and all kinds of animations and things like that. And you know, Google themselves with their material design, they came up with a spec for a certain look, and a, a lot of this has to do with animation, but they use very subtle, small animations to make an impact that needs to be made to get somebody's attention, not these huge things that are flying all over the place and tons of them in your face and you know it's just when there's too much of anything like any anybody says anything that can be abused can be i'm sorry anything that can be used can be abused it's that kind of deal people get ability to use these you know eye candy effects and they just go for the maximum benefit i mean maximum eye candy effect and maximum impact i wanted to say but the end result is the website that barely moves. You load it up in, you know, on the 24-inch screen, and it's like it just like it's moving in slow motions and, and having a heart attack at the same time. And this is the kind of stuff Google hates. This is the kind of stuff Google actually punishes. So when people talk about SEO and they say, well, this is, you know, this WordPress site is awesome and it's got SEO, you know, plugins built in, everything else, keep in mind that SEO in terms of plugins and things only goes so far. If Google is going to punish you for very low speed, for very slow loading speed, then whatever you do with the plugin for SEO specifically is not going to get you back to the top at all because Google punishes you for this other deal. Not to mention the fact that your customers or people who come to your website are going to give this horrid experience with, with just sitting there and clicking, clicking, clicking a hundred times trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, And so it's important to kind of keep all these things in mind and use common sense and get things done so information is conveyed in an appropriate manner the the words the keywords phrases david let's talk a little bit about keywords and phrases because that's also obviously an important part of seo mm, so. okay let's let's do okay <clears throat> there used to be a very real uh, link between um keyword research which use specific keywords in specific areas of a website in order to make it rank. Now, since we've got into this into the semantic web, since semantic search came along, keywords have been deprecated to a large extent in terms that they no longer work exactly the way they should or they did uh, in terms of their content. However, that doesn't mean they don't work. Like everything else, it has to have a reason and it has to link up to everything else and corroborate um, the subject. So essentially, when you're creating content, when you're creating pages, when you're creating um, any kind of navigation on your website, the terms which you use in order to actually uh, describe what you're doing, describe the content, describe the navigation, describe the pages themselves, are critical in terms of the expectation of the end user. And they're also critical in terms of how then they relate to everything else. All together, they tend to build up themes. So essentially, you know, Oleg mentioned earlier, a restaurant, for instance, <clears throat> a restaurant website. Well, if you have on your restaurant website a page about Chevrolets, the cars, well, Chevrolet. it doesn't matter how... Sorry? Chevrolet is America. Oh, Chevrolet, sorry. Uh, it doesn't matter how, um, how well optimized that page will be in a website that has to do with restaurants. It's simply out of place. It has no business being there. And it is extremely unlikely that it would rank anywhere. However, if your website is, um, if your restaurant is about, I don't know, perhaps uh, it's a fish restaurant and you have you know, special recipes on how to actually cook specific types of fish, you have special fish days and you have all those things. Now, essentially all those things which you actually put together they built up into one particular theme, which lends um, what we call domain authority. It leads to expertise. It actually adds to the all the important trustworthiness so that we keep on men mentioning always in terms of these things. And that has a very positive impact in terms of search for many different reasons. One of them is 
certainly the user behavior when they get to your website. Then there's the impact that will have in terms of social media, websites that are loved and liked and trusted are propagated way beyond their owner's efforts by the people who actually join there. And Google, Google can see all that activity. It's become very much like the offline world. Uh, Oleg started this hangout by mentioning this right from the beginning, and he's absolutely right in this. How do you work offline? <clears throat> How do you do business with people? How do you actually find businesses to, um, you know, for the things which you need? It is very, very difficult for you to go somewhere where it's cold and nobody knows you. You don't know anything about that place because you don't know what to expect. And time is short. Money is always in short supply, and so is patience. So essentially, you want to create shortcuts for yourself. Evolutionarily, we are hardwired to behave this way. We always look for shortcuts. If you want to buy a car right this minute, the first port of call be your friends. And you say, hey, I want to buy a car. Where's the cheapest dealer I can trust? Or what's the best car I can buy that'll be good for the next 10 years? And that's your starting point. And then you would go to Google search, find the models, find the dealers, find the prices. Then perhaps after you read all the technical things, you're going to go to a friend and say, hey, what should I be looking for? Because this sounds like gobbledygook. And they would give you 10 things to look for. And then you go back to those websites. Any website, doesn't matter how flashy it is, that doesn't actually meet those very real human things which you expect to see there would be out of the picture. And this is how all this becomes very real using very smart technology, really. And this is how the many layers of technology which now join us, bind us together in a very human way. Yes, and uh, I just want to gloat a little bit because, you know, this practically <laughs> never happens. You know, I was able to actually correct David on a word in English. <laughs> yeah, you're right, happens. you're so right. So I have to gloat, I have to gloat, sorry, I just have to do it. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. <laughs> anyway, um, so... We, we kind of, you know, obviously, you know, people write, you know, huge books on the subject and there's tons of them and, you know, a lot of people do web design, website design and do SEO. So, you know, we touched on a lot of things today and, uh, you know, all of these are important. If you really kind of slow down and think about it, you will see that it, it, it actually makes sense to approach it in that way and then you just need to execute and get it done. And... As I said, I want to reiterate one point before that if you don't get it done perfectly, it's not the end of the world. Just you know, regroup a little bit, you know, get a little bit more wisdom with time, get some feedback from people you're dealing with, which is something that you know a lot of people um, appreciate very much. It's it's actually a psychological marketing tactic, if you will, but it because it works so well is you know people like to be asked what their opinion is of something. So if you go out and, you know, that's why a lot of businesses ask, like if you go to a restaurant, there's a feedback form. You know, how did you like our service? How did you like our food? And so on. So. And you will be surprised how many people would actually respond to this uh, by giving you their answers. And of course, this communication, this engagement in this manner, not only creates a rapport be between you and these people, but it also establishes this connection that can be an ongoing basis and using technology, it's very easy to do to have it on an ongoing basis. And that creates this bond that allows you to deal with these customers and they become your potential lifelong customers, probably if you handle customer service, right? But if you do things the way they should be done, then this is a great vehicle to initially get people introduced to you, you know, online. It doesn't cost anything except for your hosting, which is, you know, practically, I mean, you can get hosting for a couple of bucks a month. It's essentially, you can say it's for free. So you have all this marketing machine that's in place that allows you to project as much information or as little information as you'd like. And this information is there all the time, 24 seven. It's, it's an amazing tool. That's why so many people use it because it's amazing. And of course, then you can pull it up on your phone, which is in your pocket and you can get this information like that. So it's all incredibly wonderful, useful, practical and doable. You just need to make sure you get it done right, number one. And number two, like I said, don't abuse it, but stick with the program. And if you see something, when you ask people for their feedback and they give you some kind of a negative response on something that they don't like this or they would like to see that, ask them, you know, what do you think of our website? Uh, what would you do to change? What can we do to make your experience on our website better? People, number one, they love it. Number two, it gives you priceless information that you're not going to get anywhere else.
because you're talking to people who are actually coming to your website and so they have certain interest in whatever it is that you're projecting and then you're engaging with them in that kind of manner and you're able then to convert these people from being just tire kickers potentially into long time long term customers and that's why it's important to get the website done correctly and then with this follow up process you can continually you know massage it if you will or you can you know mold it is a better word mold it in place to make it exactly what the people you're trying to deal with what they're looking for what they need to get and then that's that's basically it that's about as good as you can get right there Agreed, absolutely agreed. I, I couldn't have said it better myself. I think that's really cool. You see? And this is the same thing David would say, but with Russian accent. All right, but that's <laughs> Yeah, I've got to brush up on that one. <laughs> but that said, um, well, let's wrap it up. One thing that we were going to do, and we're still hoping doing it, is David was going to have a surprise today. So I think it's time for Yes, I am, surprise. actually. Yeah, that's really cool. All right, since um, SEO Help was first published, um, it's actually done extremely well, both on Amazon and in bookshops. And um, very recently, I um, agreed um, a promotional deal with SEMrush.com. Um, I'm uh, experimenting with some of their tools, which have a direct impact on search in terms of how we actually discover thematic links and position our websites. So there's a very good synergy there. And they will have, and I'm going to reveal very specific details in the next Hangout on Air on the subject. So, but they will have essentially a free digital copy of the book and probably, we're exploring this, uh, a, a promotional um, deal on their services so you can actually try it out. So I will have some coupons, hopefully, which we can actually give out after the hang, after the next Hangout on Air and, and Oleg will be in complete charge of them. So it'd be nice to him until then. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, you'll be able to try it out. And I think this is quite interesting because the web is changing all the time. The shortcuts, which I mentioned earlier, are things we constantly try to find in terms of time and effort. And if the tests which I'm carrying out and they look very encouraging at the moment actually pan out, these are very good tools to actually have. Excellent, excellent. And then also, not because we have to, but because they want to, my understanding is David finished his current book. Is that accurate? It is, yes. It's actually gone in, and the editing has finished. They were all extremely ecstatic with my work. <laughs> so it's made life a lot easier. Excellent. And we're discussing marketing now. We've got a, you know, quite a build up in terms of all the marketing efforts around okay. it. And then when, I know the book is not going to be out for a while, but when can you actually give us the name and the basic topic of what the book is about? When can that occur? I am going to give you an idea right now. Uh, the name itself and more specifics will come about six months before launch because that's when they actually uh, become available from a publisher. Mm -hmm. uh, but essentially what it is, it's all about optimizing your brain. It's about becoming smarter in the fullest sense of the word by actually understanding what is it that makes us think the way we do and then how can we apply it to make better decisions in just about anything? And I know this sounds like a leap from what I usually do, and everybody asks me whatever made you go into that direction, but it is, I assure you it isn't. Essentially, it is brain and analytics. You know, we look at search and how search works, and we see how it is optimized. And the brain itself these days doesn't we know it doesn't work much differently. The complexity, of course, is exponential, but the basics and the fundamentals are there, there. And if we can learn how to leverage those, we can actually get more done with the brain that's inside our heads. You know, we don't need to actually get a bigger brain, which was a huge relief to, to me when I actually discovered that. <laughs> Excellent. So you can, you know, for those who don't have the book, uh, SEO help, you can imagine if David is able to write books about optimizing a brain, brain, I mean, imagine what he can do for you for optimizing your web, websites and stuff. <laughs> um, so definitely, definitely get the book. I don't know, something in my eye. Sorry about that. Um, but anyway, so the new book is coming out. Uh, can we say that or not? We well, yeah, we can say that it's coming out in the fall of 2017, but I will be giving you details a lot more, a lot uh, long before that. 
and um, they, they, there will be also perhaps a lot of promotional things and competitions and so on. And I will just share everything, and some of that will share through the Hangouts with Oleg. Yeah. So basically, only with the Hangouts with Oleg. Exactly. And and then you know we'll definitely have a Hangout in that. But just to give it to you in perspective, is that the uh, Disney people are trying to put Star Wars Eight to come out about the same time as David's book. They just pushed it a little bit beyond that because they, they knew that they were not going to make any sales if they come out the same time. <laughs> that's kind of the timing. gives you an idea of the timing there. Okay. No, that's great. Congratulations on getting the thing fi finished. I know how much work, blood, and sweat you put into it so far, so that's yeah. awesome. And uh, yeah. uh, the only other thing I wanted to say on the SEO help thing is that uh, we initially, when David came out with the book, uh, which was, when was it, three years ago, David? Yeah, it's it's almost well. It's not quite three years, but yeah, it's not far from that. Okay, so um, you know, two 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 plus years ago. Uh, shortly after that, uh, we put together um, a tool, online tool, uh, using the Google Forms and using some Google Apps Script. Bottom line is, it's an online tool that enables you to keep track of your progress with the SEO help because SEO help itself, if you don't have the book. Uh, is broken into 20 chapters, as I mentioned before, but each chapter has 10 um, questions and 10 uh, action points, that, you know, is the better description of it, at the end of each chapter, where you're supposed to respond to it, you know, give it some thought, strategize, and then put some, what, whatever it's asking, basically do these action items as part of this particular chapter. And so because you have 10 chapters, I mean, 20 chapters, and you have 10 steps in each, uh, yeah, it's 200. It's just too too much to kind of try to keep track of it in your head. So we put together this tool online, which you can you know find if you look for it. You can definitely find it on the SEO Help community that enables you to easily start putting these action items, responses for your personal business, what you know what comes to you, so you can do a better job of actually uh, implementing what David talks about in the book. So if you're interested, you can get the tool online. It's free. Uh, it's a kind of companion, unofficial companion tool for uh, um, for the SEO help book. And um, I don't have anything else, so David, unless you have some final closing words, I guess we'll wrap it up. Um, the, I mean, the only thing that I'll say is that, you know, start thinking about your website if you're building one before you even get there. You know, start thinking about it in terms of business. Um, a lot of people don't. They make that mistake to begin with. And then things sort of... Um, there's a bit of an avalanche after that of mistakes piling on mistakes and uh, yeah i've heard an incredible number of horror stories from developers who have to deal with uh, things that you know, start out in one way and then they change into something entirely different so do your thinking before you get to that stage make sure everything's clear in your head and if that's a good place to start with in terms of clarity then everything else begins to fall into place a lot easier and um, just keep on developing in in terms of your 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 business aims. Okay, so I would say I, I thought this was going to be the last set of words, but I want to add something else. Um, speaking of the, of the same thing here, one more thing I wanted to add to what David just said is that um, when you you know definitely do this strategy ahead of time, but also I wanted to say it's very important to make sure that the maintenance is in place after the site gets launched. You know, once you design the website. You put some time into thinking about it. You put it together. You launch it. It's out there. Don't feel like you're done. Okay, you're never done. Just like your business evolves, your website should also be evolving. Not necessarily from the technological standpoint, but from the content standpoint, because things change all the time. And one of the things, the worst things you can possibly do, is to leave the stuff to be stale. You know, just like we would not eat stale food because it's going to make us sick. That's essentially what's going to happen with your website. If you have a website where you have hours of operation and they're wrong and somebody drives to your place of business and they wind up you know, kissing the luck, as the Russians used to say, because you know, it's closed, there's nobody there, it's... It, it's I love it, that phrase. <laughs> yeah, kissing the luck. It, 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 it leaves... It, 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 it creates problems on many levels. Number one, people are irritated, potentially more, more than irritated. I just don't want to use the word. Secondly, is chances of them coming back and giving you business are slim to none at that point. If I actually get to get in the car, I drive for 15 minutes, and I find out that you're closed, even though your website said that you should be open, we're pretty much done. It's just the way I am, but a lot of people are similar in that respect.
because you're showing your disrespect for them by not giving them the correct information. I mean, if you have a website, give it accurate information. If you're not going to give accurate information, don't have a website. Okay, because literally, I always tell people, you're making more damage to your business by having a bad website than not having any website at all. Okay, at least then people don't expect something and get disappointed. This way, you end up giving them something so their expectations are completely shattered. So it's important to remember that website is kind of a living, breathing thing for the most part. And if it's a brochure website where things pretty much stay the same, the photos are the same, the content, the text is the same, then if it's accurate, it's okay to leave it there for three months because nothing changed. But at the same time, keep in mind that people are not going to be coming back to your website to look at the same image over and over and over and over. They're just not. There's no interest. It's the same. They've seen it one time, second time, third time. How many times they can come see the same image? So that's why it's important to at least do that kind of stuff. You know, change the image of one of these rooms that you're showing or one of your products. You showed it this way, now show it using something else. Try to give people some variety and give them reasons to come back to your website. And the reason you want them to come back is the same reason as people advertise Coke on TV. Does anybody in this audience or anywhere in the world not know what Coca-Cola is? Okay, everybody knows it, right? From little kids to people who are about to die. And yet, exactly. yet, all of this, you know, Coca-Cola at major events, everywhere, everywhere. You go to a movie theater, Coca-Cola, and this. Everything is Coca-Cola. Why? Why do they need to advertise, spend so much money? Because repetition is the thing that gets the thought back in our head. So when we need to go buy something, as long as we have that Chevrolet or that Coke or anything else, that's what gets us to, to buy it because that was the thing that we saw recently. And that's the same thing with your website. If, you, if people keep coming back to your website, then they're going to remember that they need to interact with you in some way when it's time for them to buy whatever it is that you're selling. And that's it. So I think we'll wrap it up on that. I apologize for my shaky background. I'm going to get this green screen figured out one of these days. Um, it looks actually, pretty awesome. I, I like it. I, actually, I got to figure it out. I just need to set it up a little different. But uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the Google space. Uh, since Google events are and Google Hangouts on Air are no longer working like they used to work, events are completely gone, and the Hangout on Air is uh, working through YouTube Live events. Uh, you know, things are quite different in terms of you know all the interfaces, the calendars, and things like that. So. I'm still trying to figure out how we're going to do the calendar part integrated, but pretty much everything else is already integrated, um, can be integrated in terms of comments and questions using Google Spaces. So that's why all my Hangouts are going to have Google Spaces to go with them. It makes it very easy to have you know, additional things and at least have a text going back and forth. Look like we got several people that watched us today that did put in some um, statements and comments, and David put some things in there, so that's awesome. So definitely keep uh, a lookout for that. And if you want to use the Google Spaces yourself for these purposes, definitely, uh, I would definitely recommend it. If you have um, any questions for me or for David, drop them in there, or you can find us on Google Plus. We're easily found. And um, this will wrap up this um, Hangout on website design. We very much thank you for listening. And um, David, always a pleasure, always, always, always. Thank you. Thank you. It, was, it was brilliant. It was excellent. And so with that, we'll talk to you later. Now, people who do want to have a private hangout with David for a few minutes, uh, we're still doing it, right, David? Yeah, sure. No yeah. problem. Google Spaces has a link, so just jump in there and go directly to it, and David will answer some of the questions live for a few minutes. And again, thank you. Bye. <laughs> Take care.